But there's more than there's more to health than biology. There's a psychological aspect and there's a social aspect. And when I saw this theory, you know, it really spoke to me. You know, I saw this and I was like, this doesn't just apply to health illness. You know, this this could be approached to ask uh, resolving many issues. And I took I took this model and I applied it to child development. I thought this could help us answer how to create the leaders of tomorrow. And that's what I want to talk about today. So the first aspect is biology. So this is an amazing article that came out in the New York Times last year, February 2013. And when I read this article, it really changed the way I approach life and school. And I shared this with many of my peers and really changed their outlook on, on school. So this, this article in the New York Times addressed the question of why can some students handle stress better than others? What makes them different? And this article referenced two studies. The first study it referenced was a study done in Taiwan. And this uh, study done in Taiwan looked at a large cohort of students who were taking a big national exam, something very, very stressful. And in this study, they found that there were two types of individuals. And we'll call them Steady Steve and Mighty Max. <laughs> so that's how we called it in the study. Though. So they found in these two cohorts of people that there was a biological difference. Steady Steve had an enzyme in his brain that broke down dopamine kind of slowly. Uh, and then Mighty Max had a, had a similar enzyme that broke down dopamine very quickly, the prefrontal cortex. And just briefly, dopamine is a transmitter in the brain that's involved in many, many things. But one of the things that's in, that it's involved in is cognition. So having dopamine is important to, to thinking well, thinking uh, quickly, and to you know, do well on exams. So let's look at Mighty Max briefly. So Mighty Max has this extremely fast enzyme in his prefrontal cortex in his brain that breaks down dopamine super fast. So when there's not much stress, as in, as in this first part, when there's not much stress around, his dopamine levels fall. That's the red line right here. His, you know, when there's not much stress on a day-to-day -day basis, his dopamine levels in the prefrontal cortex are kind of low. So he's not functioning, functioning at peak capacity. But then you look at Steady Steve on the other hand. Steady Steve likes it when there's no stress because his enzyme is a little slower, so it allows dopamine to build up. Dopamine builds up into this optimal zone then. And so Steady Steve is the kid who does really well in class throughout the year. He's the kid who, who gets A's in every class when there's no stress, nothing happening, does very well throughout the year. But things change when you introduce stress. Stress changes a lot here. So when you're at a stressful situation, like a big national exam as they did in this study, the dopamine levels skyrocket. And Steady Steve, his enzyme was too slow and couldn't handle the rise in dopamine. So his dopamine fell through us, went through the roof, and, and he was stressed out, couldn't handle it. But uh, Mighty Max, on the other hand, his dopamine went up as well. But his enzyme was fast enough, and it brought the it brought dopamine levels into the optimal zone. So this is a biological difference. And I just want to make a quick aside. You know, before you start self-identifying yourself with Steady Steve or Mighty Max, don't think one is better than the other. You know, it's, Mighty Max isn't necessarily better than Steady Steve or vice versa. The article goes on to explain that evolution created two types of individuals because society needs people who can handle stress and non-stressful situations to help advance society. So it's okay if you're Mighty Max or you're Steady Steve. But more importantly, I want to bring up uh, the psychological aspect. Even if you're Steady Steve, as, as you see here, he's not so steady anymore, or for Mighty Max, it didn't mean that you would do poorly on the exam just because you were steady steep, just because you had a slow enzyme. And this study is, a, is another study done in Harvard a few years back. And it took a, 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 a group of students like Steady Steve and Money Max, and it gave them a big national exam. This time it was the GRE, the grad school exam. And what they did is in one in the experimental group, they gave them this exam, and before the exam, they, they, they showed them a brief statement. And the statement was uh, some, it summarized here. It said that people often feel anxious uh, before test, uh, you know, before test, but anxiety can actually help you. So remind yourself that your arousal may actually be benefiting you. And with this one little statement, they took kids like Steady Steve and they added 50 points to their GRE exam and a possible 100. So just because you're Steady Steve didn't doom you to, to do poorly. There's a psychological aspect at play. So this goes to show you that it's not just biology, but there's also psych uh, there's a psychological aspect. And the last thing I want to look at is, in the biopsychosocial model, is the social aspect. So here we have, uh, here we have a, a book titled The Other West More. And in this book, it tells the story of two young gentlemen, both 
Andy Westmore, who both grew up in the same neighborhood of Baltimore, Maryland in the 1970s with very similar uh, childhoods. Both of them, uh, both of them had you know, trouble with the police, both of them peddled drugs for money, both of them uh, were, were involved in some gang activity, so they led very similar lives early on. But things changed dramatically all of a sudden for one of the Westmores. The Westmore on the on your left here, he went on to military academy. And this is where their lives took different paths. The Westmore on your on your right stayed in the same neighborhood and unfortunately he, he is currently serving a life sentence in prison for robbing a jewelry store bank. But the Westmore on your left, on the other hand, not only did he succeed, but he went on to be a Rhodes Scholar, one of the most prestigious scholarships you can get. He's a former White House fellow and he penned this wonderful book. So this, we see that the social aspect is just as important. A change in social environment, a change in school, the family, and the enriching environment changed the paths that these two, uh, two young gentlemen took. So finally, I want to return to this, this man right here, uh, Jacob Barnett. So this is a picture of him two years ago giving a TED talk. Uh, and I already told you a little about his, his bright future, but it's not his future that I want to talk about today. It's his past. His past is extremely interesting. So, uh, at the age of two, Jacob Barnett was diagnosed with severe autism spectrum disorder. And his mother took him to plenty of doctors. Every single doctor told his mother he would never speak. That his autism was so bad that he had no chance. There was no, there was no way he was going to speak. But his mother wasn't going to take it. His mother wasn't going to buy that. His mother was going to do everything she could in her power to raise Jacob as best she could. And so what she did is she surrounded Jacob with things he loved. So for example, Jacob would look at a glass of water and stare at it for hours. Now unlike most mothers who would tell Jacob, oh go play outside, go read a book, go do your homework, go do something else. Instead of doing that, what she would do is surround him with 50 glasses of water and put different amounts of water in each one. Just surround him with everything he loved to, to do and see. Uh, and every night, Jacob's mother would, would put Jacob to bed and say, good night baby angel, she would do this for years. And finally, one night, she put Jacob to bed and said, Good night, baby angel. And Jacob replied, Night, night, baby angel. <laughs> so, you know, this story really you know, touched my heart. And, you know, it was, it was just really incredible seeing how, despite all odds, despite what the doctor said, not only did Jacob succeed and be able to talk, you know, he, he's, he's a genius and a pioneer in the field of astrophysics right now. So, the reason I tell you Jacob's story is because Jacob exemplifies the biopsychosocial model as a whole. First, in terms of biology, he has severe autism. And many studies have shown that some children with autism have different neuroanatomy, which gives them giftedness. Then there's a the psychological aspect as well. When Jacob looks at a glass of water, he sees it differently than how most of us see it. When I say a glass of water, most of the time I just wonder, is that my glass of water? <laughs> Uh, but Jacob looks at a glass of water and he thinks about the light rays and the shadows and the gravity and all these things that we never even think about. And then there's the social aspect, which, which is just as important in Jacob's life. And this was his mother. His mother provided Jacob with the enriched environment that he needed to grow as an individual and become the man that Jacob he is today. But the story continues. Uh, Jacob's mother saw the success of Jacob and brought it to her garage at home. She, right now, she runs a weekend and after-school program for autism kids in her neighborhood. And she uses the same techniques, biopsychosocial model, that she used with Jacob on kids in her neighborhood. And according to her, she has a success rate of greater than 90%. Using the biopsychosocial model, she's helping all these kids with autism uh, find success and, and do well in life. So from today's talk, I, I hope we can all learn from Jacob's story, learn from, from the examples I gave you today, and bring the biopsychosocial model to our own home so that we can help our peers and our kids become the leaders of tomorrow. Speech. Quite good. Very quite good. I would have liked to know the name of that enzyme though. I bet it was COMP or MA. Eric, what did you think of Shabil's speech? What do you think of Shabil's speech? <laughs> it was quite good. Quite, quite good. Quite, quite good.